wonderful subject to be teaching on today, baptism. You know, baptism is one of the most wonderful things that we can do as Christians in our obedience to God. And I love a baptismal service. It's such a, a joy and the presence of the Lord always comes. And we're going to be looking today at the importance and the joy of a Christian who actually obeys the command of Jesus to be baptised. Now, Christian baptism is actually a full immersion. It's a full immersion in water of a believer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the word for baptise in Greek is the word baptizo, okay? Baptizo, which means to dip, to plunge, to submerse, or immerse. In other words, it's the full way under the water. It's not just being sprinkled. In a nutshell, Baptism is an act of obedience, symbolising the, the believer's faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And also the believer's death to sin in their own lives, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in the newness of life in Christ Jesus that we have when we're born again. Now Acts 2 verse 38 tells us to repent and be baptised every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And in Mark 16, 16, a really important verse here, he who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now you see there the emphasis on the believing part, okay? He who believes... He who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, baptism does not save you, you see. Um, the whole emphasis is on believing first, believing and then being baptised. Now, if, you know, you go to heaven without being baptised, you do go to heaven, okay? Okay, you are saved once you've asked Jesus into your heart. So, if there's a, somebody that doesn't get baptised, it doesn't mean that they don't go to heaven. So the first question today I want to talk to you about is, are you ready for baptism? Are you ready for baptism? You know, and there's some questions you need to ask yourself. Firstly, have you had an, a personal encounter with Jesus? Was there a time when you actually prayed to ask Jesus into your life and to wash away your sin? Do you believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have you confessed Jesus as Lord over your life? Do you know that you know that you know that you've been born again? You're different because of what Jesus has done for you. You see, baptism can't actually save you. Baptism cannot wash away sin. You see, you have to believe before you get baptised. Belief precedes baptism. And baptism for the believer is simply this visual testimony that shows your prior commitment and belief in, in what Jesus has already done within your life, within your heart. And some people too think that they became a Christian because they were baptised or christened as a baby. Many people believe that. But infant baptism is not a biblical concept, okay? You won't find infant baptism in the Bible, in the Word of God, anywhere. And it comes from a belief back in the 2nd and 3rd centuries that baptism actually washed away sin. Now, this was a time when there was great infant mortality. You know, many, many babies didn't survive. And the priests back then would quickly baptise a baby as soon as it was born in the belief that it would stop them from going to hell. So that's where actual infant baptism came from. So it is not a biblical concept. And also, you cannot become a Christian by being born into a Christian family or by going to church all your life. You see, no one has always been a Christian. No one, okay? Many times when I've asked people to fill out a form and, and said, you know, when did you become saved? They put, from birth. Well, that cannot be according to the Word of God. You cannot always be a Christian. Now, I'll show you this from Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, which was Adam, and death through sin, this way death came to all men because all sinned. You see, we're all born into sin. 
Now, I know it's hard to believe that a little baby, when it's first born, you know, is sinful, but they have been born into a sin nature. Every baby is born into a sin nature. And, you know, we cannot avoid it by anything we do or don't do. We are born into a sinful nature because of Adam. And, you know, so each one of us has to come to that point in our lives when we are born again, born again into God's righteousness. You see, there has to have been a personal revelation of your own need for forgiveness and a desire to repent and ask for the blood of Jesus to just wash away your sin and come into your life and make you this new creation in Christ. Believing in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, for his death on, his cr on the cross, his burial and his resurrection, it's the only way to be saved. It's the only way to receive eternal life in your place in heaven when you go from this life. No other person can save you apart from Jesus. No religion can save you. And no amount of good works that you can ever do in your life can save you and get you into heaven. In John 14, verse 6, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one, absolutely no one, comes to the Father except through me, except through Jesus. Acts 4, verse 12, tells us salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven, given to mankind by which we can be saved, only through the name of Jesus. Now the question is, why should every Christian be baptised? Why should you be baptised if you're a Christian? Well, the first answer to that is, it's a command. It's a command given in the Bible, in the Word of God. In Matthew 28, verse 19, it tells us go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.48 says he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And Acts 2 verse 38 tells us to repent and be baptized every one of you. See those little words there? Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. So not do we also see that baptism is part of that great commission that we're given. Just before Jesus went into heaven, he gave us that commission. But it's also an act of obedience born out of our love for him. You know, when we love him, we obey him. In John, 1 John 2, verse 3 and 6, it tells us we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, and does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So that's the second reason why, why should every Christian be baptised. But also, it is an answer of a good conscience towards God. And this comes from 1 Peter 3 verse 21, and I'm going to read this in the Amplified. Corresponding to that rescue through the flood, baptism which is an expression of a believer's new life in Christ, now saves you, not by removing dirt from the body, but by an appeal to God for a good, clear conscience, demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, having a clear conscience before God is only possible through faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. You know, when you ask Jesus into your life, your sins are forgiven, and your relationship which has been broken before with God is restored. You have that restored relationship, that father-son that da and daughter relationship with Father God. And as you're baptised, you're actually testifying that God has taken away your sin and your shame. You stand before God wearing this beautiful robe of righteousness given to you by Jesus Christ. And it's brought for you 
from the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. And so the third reason that you should be baptised it is because it is your personal testimony. It is what has happened to you. Your outward confession of what has happened within your spirit, within your life. And by being baptised, you're showing that you're not ashamed of being identified with Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. We should not be ashamed of the gospel in any way. And it can be likened really to wearing a wed wedding ring, like here. You know, 35 years ago this year it would be when Jim put this wedding ring on my finger on the day that we were married, legally married, before God, before man. You know, we had the paperwork, we had the certificate. And Jim put that ring on my finger and so I was legally married. And, you know, putting on a wedding ring without being legally married won't marry you. I could have walked around with that wedding ring on without being married. People wouldn't have known that I wasn't married. But I wouldn't have been married because I had to have that legal certificate. And, you know, and it's just like being baptised. Without first receiving Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you know, you can't be saved. But when you're married, you proudly wear your rings, don't you, to show that you belong to another person. And, you know, they're a symbol of your love and your lifelong commitment to another person. And baptism is just like putting on that wedding ring. It's your symbol as shown that you now belong to Christ. His life belongs to you. You have made this lifelong commitment to following Jesus and to obeying his word. And as you're baptised, it's like you're making a confession to several things. And the first thing in your confession as you're being baptised is before heaven. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, it says, I declare to you the gospel by which you are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. So your confession is before God the Father, of your belief in the saving power of his Son, Jesus Christ. And it's just like an act of worship before the throne room. You know, thank you, God, for sending Jesus. And your confession, too, is before the church. You are now part of the body of Christ, and that is so important to understand. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us we were all baptised by one spirit into one body. And 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So you're baptised into the body of Christ. That's not a particular church. It's the church, the worldwide church of Christ. And, you know, you are part of that body. You know, some people think that if they go to a different church, then they need to be baptised again. No, because you have been baptised into the body of Christ, into the church of God. And your confession, too, is before the world. You know, that's why it's so important when you get baptised to invite unsaved people, unsaved family, unsaved friends, workmates, whoever, because you are confessing before them. You know, you have a testimony before them, before the world. Matthew 10 verse 32 tells us, Therefore, who confesses me before men, him also will I confess before my Father who art in heaven. How wonderful that is, is when we confess Jesus, you know, we are confessed before the Father. So you are no longer part of the world. You're no longer part of worldly lifestyles. You belong to a new kingdom in Christ Jesus. Now Galatians 5 verse 24 tells us, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. See, your old nature, when you got born again, has been crucified. It's been killed. It's been destroyed. It's been done away with in the spirit realm. You know, and you publicly declare to the world, you have decided to follow Jesus. That is your testimony. And also your confession is before the devil. You know, your declaration and your testimony is that himself and his works, have you have nothing to do with him. He has nothing to do with your life any longer. Your confession is before the devil. You have finished with him for good. You have changed sides. 
And Colossians 1.13 tells us, For he, Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. The devil no longer has any dominion over your life. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, baptism represents your personal identification with Christ's death, burial and resurrection. That's what baptism is all about. Romans 6, verse 3 to 5 tells us, Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we had been united with him like this in his death, we would certainly be united with him in his resurrection. Amen. What a glorious statement that is. So as someone is baptised, we picture Jesus Christ dying on the cross. As they go under the water, it illustrates Christ's burial. And as they come out of the water, it symbolises his triumphant and glorious resurrection. And in the same way, it is a visual representation of what has happened to us spiritually when we get saved. It is our personal testimony of salvation. So as we go down into the water, we see step into that baptismal tank, into the water. It represents our death to sin. As we go under the water, it represents the burial of our old life. That death to that self, dying to self. And you know, as we come out of the water, what a glorious thing that is. It represents us becoming a new creation in Christ, being resurrected into the image of Jesus Christ. And you know, we can live a life then that is pleasing to God for the rest of our days. Colossians 2 verse 12, Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, as a disciple of Jesus, it should be our desire to just follow his example in every way possible. You know, his life was one of humility, wasn't it? You know, he walked in total obedience to his Father's will. Always. He never went out of his Father's will. He never did anything except for his Father's will and purpose. And baptism for the believer is that act of faith, an act of, of obedience. It's an act of submission, of humility to the command given in the Word of God. And as we surrender our lives over to God... We're actually empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk as these new creations in Christ, to be like Jesus in every way. You see, our lives are no longer worldly. That's spiritual. You know, our death is that of the old sin nature, which was now to the cross when Jesus died. It was buried with him. And just as he was raised up by the Father, so are we raised up to walk in this newness of life. And the Bible tells us that the old things have passed away. Everything that is part of our old nature should be gone. You know, that pride, that love of sin, the reliance on works, the former opinions, habits, passions. Because it says the new has come. And we by faith have to walk into that newness of life. Old dead things have to be replaced with new things full of life, full of glory. And, you know, we delight in the things of God and hate the things of the world and the flesh. And our baptism should be just that occasion of such great joy. Now often, when Jim and I have done baptismal classes, we're asked, why was Jesus baptised? I mean, he was the son of God. He was perfect man. He never sinned. So why did he have to be baptised? We're just going to look at that just for a moment as we finish. Matthew 3.11 
and then 13 to 17. I'm just going to read you these. Now, Matthew 3, 11, this is John the Baptist speaking. I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. And I love this. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You see, John the Baptist's life and ministry had actually focused continually on preparing the way for Jesus, preparing the way for the Son of God. And when Jesus came to ask John to baptise him, John's reaction was like, whoa, no way. You know, I'm not even worthy to untie your, your sandals. You're the son of God. But Jesus replied those words, we must do this to fulfil all righteousness. And then John submitted to Jesus the will of God, knowing it was for a purpose. And see, when Jesus was baptised, he was already submitting to the Father's will in total obedience to the Father's will and purpose and choosing to die that terrible, terrible death on a cross on our behalf, becoming sin for us so that we could become righteous before God. And during those times, during those days, in order to become a rabbi, which was a teacher of the law, whose teaching people would actually respect and follow and be baptised into and follow as disciples, you'd have to receive the approval of two other established rabbis and actually submit to their authority. And you would then come under their yoke, which is their style of teaching. And, you know, I, I see sometimes the young men that come into the church that have been under, like, Reinhard Bonker's teaching. And... They're like mini Reinhard Bonkers in the way that they, they preach because they've come under the yoke of, you know, Reinhard Bonker. And so, you know, to come under Jesus' yoke, to be his disciples, you have to follow his teaching in every way, submit to his teaching. So you would come under a, a rabbi's yoke, submit to their teaching, be baptised by them. And so Jesus was asking John to baptise him, to let it be seen that he was submitting humbly to John's yoke as a rabbi and being given his approval. And John actually caused Jesus to be publicly recognised at that point as the one who he had been preaching about. This is the one. This is the one I've been telling you about. This is the Son of God. You know, this is the Messiah. And this is the one you've been waiting for. Now I can reveal him to you. But as Jesus came up out of the water after the baptism, something absolutely amazing happened, didn't it? We read about it then. The heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. And God the Father himself spoke those words, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the second authority and the second approval came directly from heaven, from God himself. You know, the people watching that day, would have seen Jesus receiving the approval of John, the established rabbi, but they also heard the approval of God, the voice of God directly from heaven, this is my son. So as you choose, as I hope to follow in the footsteps of Jesus through the waters of baptism, if you haven't already done so, you're also submitting and following Jesus' yoke, his teaching, following his word, and showing yourselves to be his disciple. And disciples, basically a learner. So we just got to listen to the word of God and, and, sh and listen to what he wants to say. And I know these, web, uh, these notes are on a website, 
um, worksheet for you. For anyone interested, there's also a list of practical requirements on there that you'll need to know about. So, so look at the, the website as well. But I just feel as we come to an end here, you know, there may be some out there that you haven't even made the first step to ask Jesus into your life. And I'm just going to pray a prayer with you. And we'll just pray together this simple prayer. And that will be your first step. Believe and be baptised. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. I thank you that you love me and sent Jesus to die on my behalf. I ask you to forgive all of my sin and wash me in the blood of Jesus. I believe that you died, that you were buried, and that you have risen again. I ask you to come into my life in the power of the Holy Spirit and live in my heart. I make you my Lord and I make you my Saviour and I will love and follow you all the days of my life.